Hello, I'm Sarah Worley, founder of The Key Clinic. As it's Mental Health Awareness Week, I wanted to speak to you today about mental health resilience and why it is some people are so much more predisposed to developing a mental health problem than others. We can't explain it by purely talking about life events, circumstances that have happened, because we all know of people who have gone through some of the most horrendous life events and emerge from it seemingly unscathed. And yet there are others for whom the smallest thing tips them over into a clinical depression or into a terrible state of anxiety. So what's interesting to me is rather than unpicking the life events that have happened, because I don't think they explain everything, I like to take a look at what's happening physically, physiologically within an individual that makes one person so much more likely to develop that mental health problem than somebody else. And there are three different areas which seem to be contributing to this. The first is to do with your biochemistry, a kind of genetic roll of the dice that you inherited. So for example, we now know that there is no such thing as one form of depression. Um, this is why these antidepressant medications, SSRIs they're called, um, tend to only work on about 38% of the population. And that's because that 38% happen not to have enough serotonin in their brains. And so for them, you give them an antidepressant medication, it works, it's very effective. But there are five different types of depression biochemically. There's another subgroup, 20%, who are what is called overmethylated. And actually, it means they've got too much serotonin, they've got too much dopamine, they've got too much um, everything firing in their brains. And if you give that same individual an antidepressant medication without testing them first, they will be much more likely to tip over into a very extreme depression or even a suicidal depression. And yet the existing approach is not to test first. Um, I'm not anti-medications, but I am all in favor of testing someone's chemistry first of all, before simply prescribing. Another group, uh, another type of depression, for example, is postnatal depression. And I think that probably would be more accurately called postnatal anxiety. And what happens when you're pregnant is your copper goes up 200% in your body. And normally most people after they give birth about two, three weeks afterwards have managed to excrete that copper from their systems. But if you happen to be in that category that's born with a little genetic snip, a mutation, that means you are not as well able to kick out copper from your body, you then develop postnatal depression and in its extreme form, postnatal psychosis, because this balance of copper to zinc is way out of ratio and too much copper, results in too much adrenaline, too much norepinephrine, the things that make you feel horrendously anxious. These things, I've just mentioned three different types of depression, but they're all treatable without necessarily having to rely on medications. It is now possible to treat them using really targeted doses of vitamins, minerals, amino acids that turn on and off the expression of chemicals within the brain. So it's amazing. It means that you can do it without the terrible side effects, the dependency issues, the other thing they don't tell you with SSRIs is over time, they become less effective and you have to dial up and dial up the dose. If you treat it from the ground up by giving the body and the brain what it needs to produce the right balance of chemicals, you don't have those horrible dependency effects. So depression, as I said, a more complicated area, I think, than the way in which it is currently being treated. Um, and I think getting on top of the chemistry can create, you know, a real sort of sea change, a complete game changer for people in terms of their functioning. Um, another area I wanted to talk about is neurodevelopment. What I mean by that is that, you know, when we're born, we're all born with our, only about 20% of our brains developed. And that first year, the brain develops very, very quickly through this series of what are called primitive reflexes, these little repeated movements babies make. Most of those complete their job and have gone by the time a baby reaches their first birthday. But that doesn't happen for all of us. In fact, there are many of us still walking around with these little baby reflexes that can mess everything up. They can mess up balance, coordination, eye tracking. But really importantly, two of them that I want to talk about completely destroy your emotional stability. One is called the Moro reflex. It's an early infant startle reflex. And you might remember it if, if, you, if you yourself were a parent. It's um, a little baby. If there's any change to that baby's environment, you'll see them do this. <gasps> okay, they fling out their arms, they fling out their legs, they inhale, they hold their breath. 
and you think, God, are they ever going to breathe again? And then the second part is they cry and they try to cling on. And when they make this reaction, tons of adrenaline and cortisol floods their system. It's a survival reflex. It's there in the first few months after birth so that any change, any sudden change to that baby's environment, light, sound, touch, texture, anything, they will send an alarm cry to the parent. Their body will be kick-started with oxygen, with, as I said, with adrenaline, um, and then they will try and cling on. So it's an important survival one. It's why a baby takes their first breath. Should have gone, should have gone by about the third or fourth month of life. Now, I cannot begin to tell you how many people at the clinic we have treated adults who still have a retained moral reflex. And if you have a retained moral reflex, you are perpetually in a state of anxiety. You're waiting for the hammer to fall. Um, you tend to be hypersensitive to things, hypersensitive to sounds, to touch, to, to textures, even to light. The eyes don't constrict to light as quickly if you've got a moro reflex. You're like a deer caught in the headlights. People with a moro dislike change, not surprisingly, because it's such a horrible feeling, this shock response being elicited that they try and control everything in their lives around them. They like it just so, they like predictability, they like routine. Um, if that's the source of your anxiety, no amount of psychotherapy and discussing it consciously is going to help you because it's coming from a lower part of the brain. It's coming from what's called the brain stem. It's a kind of visceral fear response. And the only way you get rid of that are doing very slow, controlled, repeated neurodevelopmental exercises. And what happens is we go back, you stimulate that reflex enough, and eventually it throws in the towel, thinks its work is now complete, and it goes away. And when it goes away, we see a dramatic improvement uh, in that person's anxiety levels. And, and that's how it remains then for the rest of their lives. So it can be a very big change. Um, I have too much to discuss here, but another one I just want to briefly mention is the TLR reflex. Um, and this is an early infant response to gravity. When your TLR is still retained, if, if it hasn't done its work and it hasn't gone away, there's a mismatch of information that comes into the brain about where you are spatially. Um, your eyes are telling you you're in one place. The feedback from your inner ears telling you you're somewhere else. Your muscles and ligaments are telling you you're somewhere else. And often people with a retained TLR um, get motion sickness. They tend to get car sickness. Um, uh, they're not necessarily very good at judging spaces, remembering where the car was parked, catching a ball. It can affect the eye's ability to converge. It, it messes up the inner gyroscope. So very often we see people with a retained um, TLR reflex develop phobias, and often they're spatial phobias, so it can be agoraphobia, um, it can be vertigo, it can be claustrophobia, it can be a driving phobia, because they can't judge that distance. The spatial awareness mechanism just isn't functioning as it should be. So again, something that's highly treatable through exercises, not through talking about it, through exercises that reprogram that lower part of the brain and get it working as it should do. So neurodevelopment can have a part to play in mental health problems. If, if, if your system isn't functioning as it should, you'll be more likely to be the one that tips over into that depression or that anxiety when things start happening in life. Um, the last bit that I wanted to mention just very briefly is to do with how we hear information. And that sounds like a very weird thing to be talking about when we're talking about mental illness. But the way in which we hear has a direct impact on the brain. Of course, the, the stimulation coming in from our ears is going directly to our brain. And one thing I wanted to mention was first discovered by a French ENT doctor, actually. His name was Dr. Guy Barard. And he did a lot of work correcting anomalies in the way in which people hear, um, in particular helping, for example, children with dyslexia. But during that process, he noticed very interestingly that there happened to be a particular hearing curve that is associated with very extreme suicidal depression. He called it the 2 ape curve. And when you do a hearing test, if you see a couple of peaks, one at 2,000 hertz and one kicking up again at 8,000 hertz, and it's always in the left ear. When you see that, it is invariably linked and associated with an extreme form of depression. Um, now, when he saw this, first of all, he didn't know if it was cause or effect. He thought, yes, it's really interesting and really bizarre. You know, I'm not a psychologist. Um, is it that you develop this weird hearing curve 
when you're depressed? Or does this hearing curve itself cause the depression? Does it feed the depression? His conclusion, having treated thousands and thousands of patients, was that it appears to be a causal factor, something to do with these aggravating frequencies coming in the left ear, targeting the right hemisphere of the brain, where a lot of you know, memories, our emotions um, are, are driven. So he, in the end, was referred patients by psychiatrists from across France who were extremely depressed, suicidally depressed, and his treatment was to put them through a course of auditory therapy that would last for 10 days intensively or listening to music twice a day, half an hour in the morning, half an hour in the afternoon, every day for 10 days. And specifically, this music has been created to take out the two and the eight. And what happens is, if your brain's not receiving that stimulation anymore, it starts to rewire according to the new stimulation you're giving it. And so this is a treatment that, that we also do at the clinic. And it's been very, very interesting because what I would say is his words have been borne out time and time again. Whenever I see a 2-8 curve um, and I then question the person who is in front of me who may ostensibly have come in to treat, you know, as I said, a dyslexia or some other problem. Um, and I then ask them whether they've suffered from depression. Every time, every time it is an accurate predictor. And I also know that when we get rid of that hearing curve through a course of auditory therapy, very often that depression lifts. So there are, what I'm trying to say is there are many different underlying physiological reasons why it is someone might be more predisposed to becoming depressed or anxious or phobic than another individual. And I think it's really important to carry out 360 assessments on this to find out the cause, because it could be a different cause for a different individual of their particular mental health problem. And, you know, I'm all for psychotherapy. I'm a big fan and advocate of psychotherapy. Um, but my only complaint is that it is dealing with 20% of the brain. It's dealing with the conscious bit that's talking to you now, the conscious bit that you are listening hopefully to, to me to me with but a lot of these problems are coming from lower base structures of the brain the supporting 80 percent of the brain not just the 20 percent that's having a chat and so much of psychology ignores that part of the brain and that's the bit we get a little bit obsessed about at the clinic because i think it's important to try and treat problems from the ground up and very often you get the gut functioning as it should you give the body the vitamins the minerals the amino acids it needs you get the hearing working as it should you tune up the spatial mechanism and guess what those seemingly insurmountable mental health problems are suddenly not an issue anymore the brain doesn't exist in isolation it's part of the body it, it inhabits the body and if we can get the body functioning as it should do the brain will function as it should thanks